Okay, well, uh, welcome to the first uh, HQOC ITAMP seminar of uh, the year. And it's our great pleasure to welcome Franco Nori. Uh, Franco uh, got his PhD at the University of Illinois, and he's very well known for uh, his work that really is at the interface between condensed matter physics, uh, photonics, optics, um, and has an amazing number of papers, well-cited uh, papers, including uh, a recent one, which I uh, think is partly the subject of today's talk, which is uh, Quantum Spin Hall Effect of Light, which is uh, very much looking forward to. Uh, Franco uh, has a number of distinctions. Uh, in 2013, I'll just pull out one out of many. He was uh, given the prize uh, for science uh, from it's a NITSI, uh, the, the Ministry of Science and Education in Japan. And uh, he is, in fact, in Japan. So he works at Riken. And he's been there since 2002, is about right. So that's, he's been there for a while. And uh, there are some differences between working in Michigan, uh, where uh, he holds a professorship, and in Japan. We were just talking beforehand, and one of the differences is the cultural attitude towards waistline. Uh, so when, when, Frank, when you go to the doctor in Japan, they don't measure your weight. Only they measure your waistline. <laughs> and uh, so in Japan, he's not doing so well. Uh, in Michigan, he's doing great. <laughs> uh, so with that, I uh, uh, welcome Frank out. Uh, to, uh, to uh, thank you. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Now, we have here like yearly health exams that they measure. They, they, they say, hmm. <laughs> And uh, it's a funny thing. So you go over a certain limit, they, 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 they write it down that you, you need to shrink your diameter. <laughs> but it, when I write to Detroit, I feel like a ballerina. <laughs> when I land in uh, Narita, I just feel like in the bottom. It's just unbelievable. This. <laughs> OK, so the talk is composed of two parts. The first part is some uh, part the time symmetry microcavities, and the second part, the quantum spin whole effect of light. So therefore, it's a, <coughs> this is a Japanese style, you need to, well, well, thank you very much. Many thanks to ITAMP and the director for the kind invitation to come here. It's not a canonical haiku, but it's uh, close enough to this. It's, uh, so therefore, the first part of the talk will be a very simple problem, this couple of resonators, which is very, very simple. And then uh, resonators are used in a variety of different subjects, like in this case, you have a qubit here, qubit there, superconducting qubits, and the resonator is, is used as a bus. It's a way to transfer information from A to B. And then uh, you can, it's, it's like a quantum bus. There are also tunable resonators, like a trombone, where you can actually change the frequency, and then this can be used for a variety of different Topics and people are using resonators and other devices for photonics. These are all superconducting. Also, this would be molecules in the sense of coupling um, artificial atoms together. So we have been working on, on, on this problem for, for a while. One of them is this kind of probe from one is the tunable resonator producing collated photon pairs. This is a, we did the, this is a, this is a fast moving mirror which is changing the most structure inside the resonator, and you get these uh, photon pairs being produced uh, for the dynamic Casimir effect. So the cartoon is this mirror moving here very fast, but the mechanical mirrors cannot move at the speed of, a fraction of the speed of light. So you can do, you can have an electromagnetic mirror here, which <coughs> you can change, you can have a squint, you put gigahertz frequencies here, and then the electromagnetic wall is moving back and forth very fast. So you're you're replacing the mechanical mirror by electromagnetic mirror. So we had a couple of theory papers, and eventually the experiments came along. And just many people like this very much. So therefore, resonators can be useful to explore a variety of different problems. In this case, dynamic the Casimir effect. And then, uh, so the field of these superconducting qubits began around the turn of the century, focusing mostly on qubits, how to enhance coherence times how to take care of the noise levels in the substrate, replacing silicon oxide by silicon nitride in the substrate, reducing the noise. And then people began looking, later on, looking at qubit resonators, and uh, resonators as coupling. And then years later, people started looking at this boring 
the resonators, and they found an amazing set of results where you can do like a high level of control. You can do like a photon states, combination of photon states. You can actually control the the, the coefficients. You can have an arbitrary superposition of uh, photon states in the resonator. And then uh, and there are more and more people just looking at resonator resonator interaction, which was unthinkable years ago be before the focus of the qubits, not resonator. And uh, so let me just focus on a few examples of these there are many, many of the just, uh, recent ones for the past few years. So therefore, what can you do with copper resonators? So you can do, let's look at optical diodes, for instance. It's a way to go to electromagnetic induced transparency to ATS, uh, the uh, town splitting, and then lasing also. I'll just show a few examples because we did a theory and they have been some frames with experiments. We have many other examples, but it's only mostly in theory. When you couple them, you can do you have a whole bunch of resonators. The light comes here, and then if the incoming light is resonant, you can get reflection of resonant transmission. And then the line shape is the bright beginner. We are talking about this earlier, the bright beginner scattering. If you have two of them, you can have the continuum with the bound states interact. You can get final resonances, which are more interesting. And um, let's look at two examples of copper resonators. In this case, the optical light at first, and then winning by losing, which is reversing the effect of loss by more loss. And then we have been also looking at some other examples, and uh, of course, of metrology, phone lasers, etc. The experiments are done by Shaheen Ozemir and Lang Yang at Washington University of Lewis. Here is mostly interacting between uh, Shaheen and myself. And on postdocs. So therefore, it's uh, okay. The big question some people are looking is like routes to novel structures, which are not <coughs> existing in nature. So one route is photonic crystals, which can be used for frequency selectors and uh, also metamaterials. So these are like different routes, different kind of structure with new functionalities. And a question that can be asked, is there any other route for structures that have properties which cannot be obtainable in nature uh, and they could be still interest? So therefore, one possibility is to play with the issue of gain with the two knobs, gain and loss. So this, we have been looking into applying this to photonics and also acoustics, mechanics, optomechanics. Uh, some of the groups are doing electronics. We're beginning to also look at plasmonics. So this is not, not confined to photonics. So the knobs are, you can change the coupling, you can change the gain and the loss. And then this will allow you to give you new devices, new functionalities. And uh, some of them like isolators or circulators, absorbers. So, and the three knobs will be loss, gain, and the coupling between them. In the principle, just get light going, let's say, in certain directions and not opposite, you know, not the opposite direction. So this is the goal, the big picture, the 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 goal is to look at these new functionalities in uh, photonics and, and some other systems here, like acoustics, mechanics. So that's the overall picture. So let's look at first an overview of exceptional points, EP, and by the time symmetric uh, uh, physics, then to confine these ideas to optical systems and resonators. Then uh, an example of non-reciprocal light transmission, and then loss engineering, loss in lasing. This will be for the first part of the talk. So this is the roadmap for the first part here. So therefore, it's uh, well, the Hamiltonians are of course Hermitian, and then uh, this allows you to conserve probability. The energy is real, and then you have Hermitian Hamiltonian. The eigenvalues will be real and not complex. So the hermeticity is sufficient condition, exactly, is the hermeticity is sufficient condition for real spectra? Now it is sufficient, but the question is, is it necessary? So therefore, if you have a remission, you can have the real value, but if you have non-remission, 
some components, can you also get real eigenvalues? And uh, the answer, probably many people know the answer to this question, is, uh, oops, I can get this here. And then I, is, uh, I'll see in a moment, is that you start, this is a simple non remission system, the eigenvalues are this one here, so the total loss is given by gamma 1 plus gamma 2, the loss difference is uh, this capital gamma. The beta here, the square root, can be real, zero, imaginary. Zero, when both of them are equal, so the, the modes, the super modes are equal, and this is called the exceptional point. So the frequencies coalesce. In this case here, the frequencies split, but the damping is the same. In this case, the damping is different but the frequencies are coalesce. So there are these uh, three possible scenarios of same damping or same real part or both of them equal. This is in the EP point or exceptional point. So going back to this, if the Hamiltonian commutes with the PT operator, then you can have a non remission Hamiltonian that gives you real eigenvalues. And these systems are generic in nature because there are losses. There is damping, there is dissipation, there is damping. So it's, uh, it's uh, if the commutator does not apply, does not satisfy that it's not, it's not zero, then you get complex eigenvalues. So it is possible to get a real spectrum even though the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian. PT symmetry means invariance on their parity and time reversal. Some people here know, but perhaps some of the students might know. So therefore, the parity operator changes the sign in this manner, twice the identity. Time reversal operates in this manner. And then uh, the PT operator operates uh, like this. And when you do it twice, you get the identity. And they commute with each other. So this is well known to the AMO community, not so much in the, in the condensed matter community. So if we start with the Schrodinger equation here, you can change here T to, in this case, which are the conditions for this to be PT symmetric. Therefore, you apply PT, so you change T to minus T, X to minus X, X to minus X, here doesn't change, and so forth and so, so forth. In order for this to satisfy one to the other one, then the wave function satisfies the Schrodinger equation, and in order for this to be satisfied, we need to, satis we need to have this condition that B of x is equal to B star is the complex conjugate minus x. So if this condition holds, then you can have the wave function satisfying the Schrodinger equation and also the, the PT one, the PT version, which is this one here. So this is. I think this might be well known to most people in the audience. And uh, so therefore, to satisfy this uh, symmetry, then you need to have this condition on the potential. This is known. Now, in optics, what we're looking is at the electric field confined on a whispering gallery modes or, or fibers, in this case, the equation to study is this one here, this paraxial equation of diffraction for the electric field. But this one here has a mathematical structure that can be mapped into this one here. So this is a quantum problem. This is a classical problem. This is the condition for PT potential or PT symmetry in the quantum case. And this is the analog case, the analog one for the classical case. So we're going to be focusing here in this column here using ideas that were developed initially for the, the PD case. The NX has a real part, an imaginary part, referring to loss and gain. And then there are different cases here where you can get the real eigenvalues, the complex eigenvalues. You can get the recovery the Hermitian Hamiltonian. So there is here a dictionary between the classical case over here and the quantum case in this column. It's like a mathematical mapping between one and the other one. So 
So to realize PT symmetry in optics, then you need to play with the real part and imaginary part of this uh, of the index of refraction. And then you, you need to prepare a system that has uh, uh, that is, has this uh, index of refraction which is different in different parts of the structure. So therefore, you can have, for instance, a couple system of two optical structures, one with loss and one with gain. And when they balance, then you can have a PT symmetric uh, uh, system. And ideally, you need to be able to control the coupling strength between them. So I'll show you how, how this can be done. Theoretically, it's very easy. Experimentally, it's a bit trickier, but I'll, I'll show you how, how this can be done. So therefore, we have here uh, the, so we have the two systems here. What the P operator does is to exchange them. Therefore, you have in the middle your, your origin. You change x to minus x. And you're essentially flipping them. And if one was moving to the left, and another one was moving to the right. But essentially, it means to exchange the systems. In the case of uh, T, what it does is gain becomes loss, and loss becomes gain. And then uh, it should be the same color, but in the, in the PowerPoint presentation, it's a bit messed up. And this can be seen like if you start with, let's say, a certain amount of money, right? you invest in the stock market, and then you lose all the money. If you, so therefore, you have loss. If you can do time reversal operation, the loss becomes gain. You're going backwards. It doesn't happen in uh, real investment environments. But, uh, so here is that you can apply the T operator. And the T operator, we're actually flipping them. The dark blue should be, uh, it should be darker, but it's not showing a darker here. And then, uh, and this one here is when you apply both of them. So you're essentially reversing them. <coughs> you're flipping them. This is the cartoon version of what we saw before, essentially exchanging the systems or change gain to loss or loss become or changing loss to gain. So for instance, you have a system like this where there is a loss on both sides, you can have one of them with loss and the one with gain. In this case, we're just changing the sign and this mathematical. I'll show you how this can be done. And physical experiment here. So therefore, if the Hamiltonian is of this form here, you look at the super modes here, and then uh, the beta gain can have these values, which, in, which involve split frequency, and then uh, coalesced frequency, no damping, this is a PT phase transition here. And then here, there is the real parts which are coalescing, and then there is one mode that we find, and the other mode dissipating. Three possibilities in this case, where there is one with plus and one with minus, one with gain and one with loss. So this is an example of a PT symmetric Hamiltonian. So the three different cases uh, of the systems here. So, so we talked about gain and loss. So we'll talk in a moment how to change the coupling in these experiments here. So right now we're going to PT and EP optical systems and resonators. So we talked about one, uh, let's go about two. So uh, many of you are familiar with whispering gallery modes. Uh, the, the canonical one is in some old cathedral. One of our collaborators is Turkish, so he put this one here in Istanbul. And so these experiments are done in St. Louis. They put another one in St. Louis there. So therefore, the sound waves are confined along the walls and propagate and are refocused through these internal reflections. It's been explained by Lord, Lord Rayleigh a long time ago. So therefore, we're interested in structures that propagate light in the same manner, in the same way. One way to do that is to use these uh, whispering gallery optical resonators, where you have this total internal reflection. They come in different varieties, different shapes here. And then you can get this out. They have low optical loss, sharp resonances, high quality factors, long photo lifetimes. 
if the uh, mode volume can be made small, so therefore it's a tight light confinement, intense resonant light, so therefore there are some advantages. It is long for the lifetime, intense light, so you can have enhanced light matter interaction. So this is the motivation to look at the systems. There are many, many positive sides aspects they have. And then the one we'll be showing, we'll be focusing today will be this one here. Our progress we're doing this experiment. The Qs are all the other things. The A, the radius between 10 and 30 microns, and the powers involved are traditionally small ones. And the number of round trips, the optical path is about 30 meters. Therefore, the way to couple light into this whispering gathering modes is, is through these fibers, which are uh, placed on top of a fire, and then they are stretched. So they become very, very thin, and therefore the photons can leak towards the left and the right. Here, these uh, evanescent modes. So there are other groups doing uh, either prisms or fibers. In this case, it's called this uh, fiber taper, where they are essentially stretched, become very thin, and then there is evanescent wave coupling here, so the evanescent light begins to rotate here, it's out either in one direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. So this is a way to couple light into these uh, whispering gallery microcavities. The way they look like, they look like these mushrooms here. There is one example here, another one there. These are typical dimensions right there. It's the top view. So there is here this, uh, the top view and the side view. So there is this uh, fiber located right next to the edge. And then since it has been stretched, the photons are leaking out. And then there is evanescent wave coupling between the fiber, which is here, and the resonator, the edge, the edge. These are the microtoroids. Now, the problem with these systems here is very difficult to control the coupling between them, because after they are made, they are fixed. You would like to be able to bring them together, you would like to pull them apart. The trick to do so, is the following, is to make them at the edge. If they're put at the edge, you can have one here, another one here, and then slowly move it them closer to each other, and, move and, pull, and pull them apart. So these are edge microtoroids, and the examples are right there. So therefore, this is the top view, and you see this dark, cliff is essentially it's a gap between this substrate which aims right here and the other substrate that aims right here so there are these uh, um, fibers uh, which are on both sides you can see only one of them but there are two so therefore you can see the light can go in the direction here and then out and it's possible to change the coupling by bringing them together and far apart are these edge microtoroids. Now, how to do gain? So, therefore, these objects are typically lossy. If you want to have one with gain, you need to dope them. In this case, they are Erbian doped. Actually, they, they are pumped at a certain frequency, they emit a different frequency, the output is mainly proportional to the input, so you can actually get them to, to, to have gain one of them, and the other one is lossy. So therefore, the aspect of gain is taken care of. Now, the PT symmetric optical systems involve coupled structures that have balance, gain, and loss. Could be waveguides, could be resonators like these, so there are some of them, the green ones have gain, the other ones have loss, could be three, two, there are different possibilities. So, an example.
example here is uh, on here is our whispering gallery modes that trap light efficiently in a total interval reflection. And then they act, as you see here from this uh, cartoon, like a dial where the light is coming here, goes in this direction here, and goes out. When two identical optical resonators couple, they form this photonic molecule. So therefore, the individual modes undergo this mode splitting, similar to the transition of the electronic level between atoms for molecules. So you can get your energy levels, and then there is mode splitting, like in the normal uh, formation of uh, uh, molecules from atoms. The difference being is that if you have balance, gain, or loss, the response is nonlinear. It's a nonlinear optical isolator based on parity time symmetry. So therefore, there is this optical nonlinearity allows the light to go in one direction, but not in the opposite direction. So you're breaking reciprocity. So therefore, it's a... Uh, Okay, so the speed here, and we talk about this. So if you have a simultaneous presence of gain and loss, you can alter the frequencies, but also the spatial profiles, where the energy is uh, located. So there is an initial version of spontaneous symmetry breaking, where there is a phase where the energy is on the left and on the right. But when you change the coupling, the energy goes into the, into the resonator that has gain. So you essentially just break the symmetry. So essentially, the PT broken mode or PT broken phase is spontaneously concentrated in, uh, is in the amplifying half. So therefore, it undergoes a net gain is an amplifying half, or net loss is the other one, but typically the one with gain. So therefore, this is the top view, the side view, and then the red lines is the dots are the data and the lines of the theory. This is what happens when you have a normal lossy resonator and a lossy resonator. The frequency here is omega naught. The frequency here is omega naught. And you bring them together. You bring them closer <coughs> to each other. There is mode splitting. And the mode splitting is linear. And this is what happens with the red lines. Because the frequency here is omega naught on the left, omega naught on the right. Bring them together and then they split. And then they're both lossy. So therefore the red curves are coupled lossy resonators. They're both losing energy. So in this part it is negative. And you can change the coupling strength and they remain lossy because they were lost in the beginning, they remain lossy at the end and there's nothing happening there. This is a standard uh, splitting of the super modes. However, in the blue case, when you have the speed symmetric resonators, and there is a balance between gain and loss, something happens. One of them is lossy, and then becomes less and less lossy. One of them has gain, but then it begins to lose more and more energy. And eventually, they both become mildly lossy collectively when the coupling strength is strong enough, and they both become lossy, but not as lossy as before, because one of them has gain. So therefore, the blue curves, when you have one lossy and one with gain, have a different structure they do it as, as before, compared to before. In this case, when you look at the, at the frequency, it remains omega naught and omega naught. So when you bring them together, it stays omega naught. It doesn't change. There is no more splitting. But eventually, the coupling becomes strong enough, and bang, there is continuous integration. So therefore, you can go to the top and the bottom here. So you see this phase transition, and then uh, in the broken symmetry phase, the eigenvalues become complex. And the coupling strength is varied by changing this gap here, which can be barely seen here, but you can see better from the top. So the red part is when you expect the two resonators are together, and the blue part is uh, not so <coughs> obvious here. So then. We're starting again, we're looking at this corner here where there's a system that has loss. So we cannot describe it like this. Even though there is loss, we can do 
this corner it is symmetric, so we have this. Uh, we can um, at, the, at the point where there is the the balance between gain and loss, and then uh, and by doing this, so in this case we have here in the case of t, you're essentially flipping them. P effectively you're flipping them back again. So this is the PT, PT symmetric system. And then in this case, the energy is concentrated on both of them, which are mildly lossy. And then here, there is mostly concentrated in one of them. And here is concentrated completely on one of them. Here, is the second one you cannot see. Essentially, it's almost invisible. Essentially, in the, and, uh, so therefore, the energy is concentrated into one here. It's concentrated in the other one. But then slowly, slowly, the energy is being move from the left to the right and eventually goes into both of them. And here from the right to the left and eventually both of them. So this is the, the cartoon of the PT operations in this diagram here. And then, uh, okay, this I just show you already here. If you have two resonators and you change the Q factor, let's say from to approximately 2 to approximately 3 times 10 to the 7, and you can get these two phase transitions. So therefore, the lower the quality factor, which means the higher the loss, the higher the critical coupling strain for the PT phase transition. So therefore, different cues will give you different bifurcation diagrams here. Okay, the shaded regions correspond to the broken PT symmetric region where the gain and loss are balanced. And then here there is an enhancement of the optical linearity. So there is here the unbroken symmetry phase as a linear response. And in this case, it saturates. It saturates with a few microwatts. So the laser pointer, which is I have here, is between one to five milliwatts. But what they, my colleagues, an electrical engineer, what they wanted to achieve is a, is a diode with three orders of magnitude less power than a laser pointer. Since so they were thinking for for tiny devices on a chip. So therefore, the fact that this nonlinearity occurs at low power is important for presumably for future applications. So therefore this input output relation becomes more linear. And then the field is localized in the resonator with gain. It doesn't matter if the field is input on the loss resonator or the resonator with gain. Essentially there is a spontaneous with the breaking and this field localization effectively enhances the nonlinearity. Here in the linear regime, it doesn't matter when you put the input port and the output, this, the signals are pretty much the same, unbroken symmetry, broken symmetry. But if you go into the nonlinear region, there is some parts where essentially some direction where there's essentially zero response in one direction, and there is a response in the opposite direction. Just so acting like essentially like a perfect optical dial. So in this case, you're breaking reciprocity. It's the non-reciprocal transmission in the nonlinear region. So therefore, it's uh, okay. It's a bit too long, but since you already explained this uh, in uh, words, so therefore there is here complete absence of signal in one direction. This can be achieved for very low powers. To observe no reciprocity. There is no applied magnetic field is needed. This is the first non-reciprocal light transmission based on PT symmetry concepts. It's uh, if PT symmetry is not enough, you need to have some non-linearities. Uh, okay, so this is okay, summary of the top of this part here. Now before we have one resonator was lost here, one with with gain. Now imagine both of them to be passive. So is this one here? So there is a lossy resonator. There is here a weight guy. And can you get lacing by increasing loss? So, it's, uh, so in this case, you have here a tip, and the tip is enhancing the loss. When you, when you increase the loss, 
you can get actually this uh, ring to, to leaves, which is counterintuitive because you're not supposed to get uh, leaves in uh, the loss, you need to gain somewhere. The cartoon is this one here, there's a waveguide, two resonators, you increase the loss here, and bang, it starts lazy. Okay, this is already explained all of this. Okay, there are two independent parameters, the coupling strength and the loss. And then, so here it is. So you begin, these are the two systems that talk to you. This is the needle, the needle is right there, it's a tip, tenable gap. So we have two parameters, the coupling between them and the loss. So you start the real part and the imaginary part at these points here, increase the loss, and they go to the exceptional point. The exceptional point means the real parts are equal, the imaginary parts are equal. But then when you increase the loss further, one of the resonators loses energy very quickly and is dumping energy on the other resonator that gains a little bit of energy enough to go lazy. So therefore, initially the real parts, the supermost coalesce, the imaginary parts initially coalesce and then, and then bifurcate. Then one of the modes becomes so lossy as dumping energy to the other one. And then this is an example of symmetry breaking at a certain point, and that's why you can get uh, lacing we increasing the loss, lacing first stops, and then regrows. And then this is uh, this is counterintuitive because the increasing the loss is pushing the system close to a sectional point that means localizes the, the field in the less lossy resonator. And beyond this uh, exceptional point, increasing the loss help recover run a lacing. And you tell the details, so I'll, uh, I'll skip them right now. And then, uh, okay, let me just go into this part and go into the other part here. Now, the second part of the talk will be on the quantum spin ball effect of light. So, this work is done in collaboration with Kostya Bliok and a student there in Smirnova. These more details are here. And then uh, I'll give a very quick overview of various types of quantum ball effects for electrons in one slide. In one slide's overview. Then, afterwards, we're looking at uh, the case for light. So, let's start with the <coughs> first. So, this is the one slide overview or the quantum ball effect. In this case here, you see there is a magnetic field in the sample. In the spin hole effect, in the bulk, there is no magnetic field. In every case, there, are, there is a, the bulk is insulating. So for all quantum ball effects, the electrons flow through these lossless edge channels, with the rest of the system being insulated. But let's focus on the first two. Here there's a magnetic field, there is no magnetic field. But notice here that the spin up current and the spin down, they're moving in the, in the same direction. In this case, they're moving in opposite directions. So this is your, your one slide summary of the quantum Hall effect for electrons. Now let's do, let's do a one slide summary of the quantum spin wall effect and topology insulators for electrons first. One slide. So therefore, in this case, quantum spin wall effect means, again, the presence of these edge modes at the interface between two two-dimensional insulators. And these modes have something called strong spin momentum locking. The meaning of this is the following. It means opposite spins propagate in opposite directions. That you can see it here. Now the greens are moving one direction and the red ones the opposite direction. You see some of the original papers are here. Now this is a one slide summary for the 3D case. In the 3D case, a 3D topological insulator is a 3D generalization of what we saw before. So in these insulators, they had these 2D surface modes which have these uh, helical, massless fermions, this is in case space, with spin momentum locking. It's called the vortex spin texture in case space. And in real space, they have these uh, 
currents, these eight states which are moving in opposite direction depending on the speed. After doing these uh, brief summaries, now let's look at the photonic counterparts of these uh, electron hole states. Both the whole effect and the quantum hole effect with, with this unidirectional edge propagation have been reported in magneto optical system with broken by the reversal We're going to focus here on the property that these photons, being relativistic, they, they naturally exhibit spin orbit interaction effects, including very phase spin hole effect, because of these uh, fundamental spin properties, in particular the transversality condition. And, uh, so therefore, the only missing part so far in the above optical hole effects is the quantum spin hole effect for photons. Let's look at this, at this quantum spin hole effect by looking at the surface modes that have the spin momentum locking. There has been recent suggestions of photonic topological insulators that can be created with very contrived, complex metamaterials. So we have shown that pure free space light already possesses intrinsic quantum spin hole effect. So you do not need any contrived complex metamaterials. And simple natural materials such as metals supporting surface plasma polarity modes can exhibit some features that resemble topological insulators. Are not going to be the same because in one case you have electrons, in another case there is photons, there's a mass, zero mass here vastly different systems, but even though they are vastly different, there are some deep analogies between them. So therefore, we have been working on this transverse spin uh, for a while, and then we began noticing that there were several experiments on spin control unidirectional excitation of surface modes, or waveguide modes. And then we thought that all of these, which are in different fields, like these surface plasma polaritons, and people have these nanowires with the dot particles and the photonic crystals, even though they're different subcommunities, they could be all interpreted in a unified manner as manifestation of the quantum spin hole effect of light. So the basic spin properties of light are summarized here. These are the bulk modes for free light are propagating plane waves. So this is the helicity and photons carry spin. So this is the longitudinal helicity dependent spin. So it, as you notice here, is oriented along the propagation and depend on the helicity sigma. So this is what they call the helicopter mode. So they propagate along the z direction and then the rotation of the electric field is like a helicopter. Now, what happens when you have a metal on the negative axis, and then on the positive x-axis, you have the vacuum? In this case, you get evanescent waves. But how do you describe evanescent waves? You put here kx is an imaginary value here, and that gives you the evanescent wave. But then the transversality condition means that you are not going to be propagating like this a helicopter mode. You're going to be propagating like this, what some people call the John Travolta mode. But my students say that I need to practice it more and put uh, grease and smile. But uh, anyhow, so, it's, uh, so in this case, there's a cycloid. Because this can be done in two lines. You put this here into the equation here, which I'll show you in a moment here. This is the simplest way to derive. This one here is evanescent wave. You put it here. This is imaginary. So this means there will be a cycloid motion in this direction here. But this means there is momentum going in this direction. And this happens also with surface waterways. I'll show you in a video. It's a classical analog. So therefore, what's puzzling about this 
is that the, the spin, the intrinsic angular momentum, is transverse. And that's not what you find in Lambda Oblicious or Jackson or Born and Wolf, supposedly longitudinal. Moreover, it's elicitly independent. So therefore, the summary is the following. Evanescent wave is a plane wave that has a complex wave vector. The transversality condition is fundamental. This generates an imaginary longitudinal z component in the polarization vector in contrast to the purely transverse. So this is what gives rise to this, uh, to this mode here. This component produces this xz plane, this cycloid rotation of the electric or magnetic fields, and generates this unusual transverse field in evanescent waves at the surface. So this is uh, the nature of the transverse spin is similar somehow. This is a classical analogy would happen in surface waves. Even though the wave is moving from one edge to the cone to the other edge, locally the molecules are doing this rotation here. You don't have every molecule going across the pond. And this means there is a angular momentum, which is transverse. But this happens at the edge. When you go to, toward the bulk, it's not going to happen there. It's an edge effect. And this is what we studied years ago about this extraordinary momentum in spin or in evanescent waves. So therefore, if you look at Born and Wolf, Jackson, Landau, Lich, they tell you the momentum of light is determined by the pointing vector. Everybody knows this. The momentum of light is directed along the wave vector and is independent of polarization. To a certain extent, Kepler knew that, I mean, he didn't know about photon, but Kepler was noticing the tail of comets, Kepler and others, and he was noticing that it's away from the sun, so therefore the light has radiation which is longitudinal, not transverse. The spin angular momentum of light is determined by the cycle of polarization and is directed along the wave vector. So this is standard stuff. Jackson, Warner Wolf, Landau Richard. What we have found, looking at different experiments on, on these confined subjects, is that there were many cases where the first point, the, the first uh, statement was not holding, the second one was not holding, the third one wasn't holding either. So therefore, we began studying this more carefully from the point of view of the fundamental field theory and trying to derive all the angular momentum in a systematic way. We have a long review of these reports and a shorter one in, in Nature Photonics last year where everything is done systematically from ground zero to derive everything, including at the known results and the new results. And they are, they are very, very, very long, systematic, and, and, uh, and also we have some, we convinced some experimentalists here to look at the direct measurements of this extraordinary optical momentum and transverse spin dependent force using a nano cantilever. It was published a few months ago. So therefore, there is here total internal reflection. And there is the standard canonical momentum, this is a wave vector. And there is this component, which is related to what in field theory called the Belifante uh, momentum, which was assumed to be fictitious years ago. It was like controversial for a while in field theory. But we're able to derive everything from fundamental things. And, then, and it's possible to measure this weak spin force. This is about 1% of the force here. But this is the first measurement, and this we're doing cantilever. There has to be a better way to measure this. So, and, uh, so this is, and this cantilever here, there is a momentum in one direction, the, the transverse one here, and there is light applied in different directions, and then it's possible to look at the longitudinal force in pico-newton. The transverse force is about two orders of magnitude weaker. So here is 10 to the minus 3, but there's here an extra 0 to 10 to the minus 2. It's possible to actually measure it, to model it, to understand it in detail. And, uh, so therefore, this unusual transverse spin, which is independent of polarization survives in the TETM surface modes. More importantly, opposite direction of propagation correspond to opposite transverse spins. And this exactly is a quantum stimulus effect of that. I'll show you have some examples now for different experiments in a moment. So 
therefore, this is surface plasma polarity at the edge here. So therefore, you take into account transverse spin, the usual metals exhibit the surface modes with spin momentum locking as infinity topology insulators. In this case, the metal is an insulator for photons, not for electrons. That's assuming that you're below the plasma frequency. So therefore, in this case, the metal is an insulator. Outside, you need your light, light cone, looks like a standard inner cone. And then you can get this thing here, this excitation like in topological uh, insulators. It's in case space, it's in uh, energy. So therefore, this is a metal vacuum interface resembles, it's not the same. Using a condensed matter analogy, the interface between a semi-metal and an insulator. But this is not a semi-metal, this is a vacuum. And this is not an insulator in the usual way, this is a metal. So it's a, it's a very unusual kind of analogy here. So the, but this optical spin momentum locking has been observed in different experiments, in different contexts, separate. Some involve super plasmons and the metal vacuum interfaces. And then, uh, so therefore, it's a, uh, and this surface plasma polarity of modes is resemble the, So the typical experiment looks like this one here. So there were several groups independently reporting experiments on spin depending on direction of excitation. And the typical situation was like a little gold particle here. The light was incident here. So this transversely incident light with, with the usual spin. It's a scatter here. And then there was a spin dependent direction of the surface mode. So therefore, one helicity was generating current in one direction. The other helicity in the opposite direction. So this is the, the schematic diagram that will correspond. I will show you for the moment four abstracts. And we're going to read for each abstract is one sentence. And there are different systems with different geometries. But the essential idea is this one here, for all of them. This one was published not too long ago by this group in Vienna. It's called Chiral Nanophotonic Waveguide Interface Based on Spin Orbit Interaction of Light. So therefore, they realized a chiral waveguide coupler where the handness of the incident light determines the propagation direction in the waveguide. Therefore, they can control directionality. They can direct, uh, it used to be 94% or 99% of the in-coupled light in a given direction. So therefore, the goal, the objective, is to control and manipulate uh, light in these optical waveguides and uh, solar applications. So therefore, this is another group here. Clippers uh, at all, this is nanophotonic control of circular dipole emission. And then, uh, in this case, the helicity can couple to left or rightwards propagating modes with near unity directionality. So, therefore, the measurements demonstrate, that was not too long ago, the possibility of coupling the spin to a photonic pathway. Another experiment here by uh, a group in Vienna that was uh, not too long ago. Quantum state control direction of spontaneous emission of photons into nanophotonic waveguides. So therefore, the transverse spin changes sign when direction of propagation is re re reversed. And then they can, uh, exactly, they can control the propagation direction of the excited state. And then uh, it's... Uh, Exactly. So they expect this to be important to control how the light propagates in waveguides and by changing the, the helicity of the incident light. So this is some of the cartoons here. So this here, the, the, the incident light can have the, the helicity in one direction or the other one, and this is an nanoparticle. 
and it can actually fire photons to the left or to the right, depending on the hardness of the incoming light here. In this case, it's a photonic crystal waveguide where the incoming light has a hardness either to the right or to the left. These are different groups. And uh, this one here is by Zayer et al. This is uh, UCL in London. Spin orbit coupling in surface plasmon scattering by nanostructures. So therefore, they demonstrate a reciprocal effect spin orbit coupling in the direction of propagation of surface plasmon wave that has this transverse spin that is determined by determine the scattering direction of the spin carrying photons. So essentially, the same idea. But, and, uh, They do the analogy here with the inverse pinball effect. So in this case, there is this left uh, helicity or right. And in this case, they're firing the surface plasma polarities in one direction, or they're firing them in the opposite direction. And they even do the opposite. In this case, uh, depending on how the surface plasma polarity comes, it can actually generate light with the right helicity. So they see the whole. The, the process, the reciprocal process. So these kind of effects have been seen in a variety of different experiments. So for right now it's probably time to end. So, so we have shown that pure free space light without metamaterials, without polymer crystal, without any contrived or complicated system already possesses intrinsic quantum thermal effect. <coughs> Simple natural materials, such as metals, supporting this uh, surface plasma where the most exhibit features that resemble topological insulators, which of course are very different, are completely different objects, but there are some analogies. We show that this recently discovered transverse spin in a very recent ways that we've been working theoretically for a while, and this spin control in direction of excitation of surface or waveguide modes can be interpreted as manifestation of the quantum spin wall effect of light. And this is intrinsic. And this is, uh, the, this, is, this is the strong spin momentum lock in the surface maximum mode is intrinsic. And then, uh, and this transverse polarization independent spin in Vanessa ways stems from this transversality condition and the intrinsic spin orbit interaction of light. So this is responsible for it. It's quite different in origin from the quantum spin wall effect of electrons, which are fermions. So therefore, in that case, there is, uh, is in one case, spin momentum coupling rather than spin or momentum coupling. So there are very different bits, and we put them side by side in the supplementary line information in the paper. Science. I have extra copies. If you're interested, I have some spare copies of the paper if you're interested. I'm sorry. It's, uh, and then, uh, so, so this is, uh, thanks for your attention. Similarity, but it's a different. So in this case, the, sim the, the system corresponds to a wire. You put a particle here. You, you're essentially impinging light on the particle, and the action on this particle is going to fire photons on the left and on the right. And this, I don't know if you can do it polarized or not, but the, the experiments are of a different nature. Essentially, like uh, you're saying that this could be done with polarizers, for instance. This is a different phenomenon. Here they're looking at super polarity particles, and, and uh, I don't see how this can be done with. So here the goal is different. They're trying to essentially control 
light propagation within waveguides or wires or surfaces by changing the helicity of light. So I'm sure, I mean, other people could do different kind of experiments, that's perfectly fine. I'm sure the experiment you have described has been done before by many people. So this is a different kind of uh, experiment and asking different questions. And um, so in the standard understanding of the electronic quantum spin Hall effect, it would say the time reversal symmetry is crucial, and also the fact that electrons are spin half is crucial to this session. So how does that translate to this idea of quantum spin Hall electron light? It doesn't translate directly because in one case there's fermions, bosons, massive, massless. So therefore there is, the system is very, very different. So the analysis, the one I was showing before, it's, uh, it's uh, this one here. It's, uh, essentially, the, it is an analogy between the, uh, this, this metal vacuum interface resembles the interface with the semi metal <coughs> is later. But of course, this is a very different. For the electron one, you'll never say a metal is this way. And in this case, the vacuum is not going to be a semi metal, but it has the same structure. So the systems are vastly different. And this invention is an analogy. The actual mathematical comparison is done in the supplementary of, of the online information, but it's a, they're different objects. One more uh, question. Let me see if I can have another one. Uh, I'll just like uh, yeah, I know you don't have it here. Uh, no, I, I have some of the technical slides afterward, but uh, we are not here now. Um, so you show. Is it okay to ask? It is. We want to go ahead. So you showed some slides uh, with coupled resonators, which look like an isolator uh, setup. Um, early on, is is that isolator lossy? So, does it prevent travel in the re reverse direction without losses? So, I guess I'm just wondering. So, you said that in one direction it lets light through, in the other direction it doesn't. What Correct. happens to that light that doesn't go through? Yes. the nonlinear region where there is a high input power, uh, you change here, the input here is port 4, the output is port 1, in this case you do the opposite here, so in this case uh, broken or broken symmetry doesn't matter, there is transmission, in this case the transmission is zero, exactly zero when you go from, from this direction to this direction here. Because the energy is concentrated on the one with gain, so it doesn't get to the other one. And, and what happens to the light? So it, it just keeps, um, light just gets trapped in the resonator? It keeps rotating, keeps rotating. Does it go out through port two? Sorry? Can it escape through port two? Yes, there is light going to port 2 because essentially here the photons, some of the photons here are evanescent coupled here, but many photons continue here. So in this case, the transmission is between these and this one here. If, if it goes here, it's a standard fiber optics, of course it will continue. But the question here is can we use the two resonators to break non reciprocity? And the way to do that is to compare this input and this output with this input and this output and see the, uh, the output in uh, port 4 and port 1. And, uh, so but if it is over here, it still is going to continue because this is a, it's a fiber optic. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.